Um, my name is David Lesher. I'm the Government Affairs Director at PPIC, the Public Policy Institute of California. And I'm sure, does that help? I, I'm sure uh, a lot of you are very familiar with PPIC, uh, the Public Policy Institute of California, but we are a nonpartisan independent think tank uh, based in San Francisco with offices here in Sacramento. Uh, we do research on most all of the topics that cross the plate here in Sacramento, as well as a, a monthly uh, public opinion survey. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, the California's changing accountability system and a little bit about the format. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll do a welcome here. I'll introduce uh, our speaker to present the report, uh, and then we'll have a, a, he'll introduce a moderator to come up and, and talk to an extra expert panel that will give us some perspective, but particularly from the local level. Um, so a couple of quick announcements before we get started. Uh, I wanted to say a thank you to the James Irvine Foundation for helping to support the work that you're going to hear today. Uh, also, uh, this is being taped for broadcast, so if you want to avoid an embarrassing moment, you might silence your cell phones. Um, also, uh, there is on your chair, I believe, a, a salmon colored sheet that uh, is an evaluation form. Uh, if you wanted to fill it out at the end and tell us how you think we did, uh, you can drop it off at the table on your way out and that would be very much appreciated. Um, and we have a particularly hot topic today, so there's not a lot of empty seats. There's, I think there's a couple of them up front here. If somebody wants to uh, uh, come up and sit sit close to the front. There's a couple seats up here in the front on the right side and a couple right here. So, um, but the rest, you, you'll be standing room only and if you're on the wait list and haven't checked in, please do so. Uh, it'd be good to know, uh, keep you on our list going forward and to know who we've had in attendance here today. Um, also, a couple other last quick announcements. We have an event, uh, a couple upcoming events next week, next Friday, uh, February 1st. In this room, we have uh, an event about the state budget. There will be a presentation from a, with a new report from PPIC and also a panel discussion uh, that will look at the budget that the governor proposed and then especially at the upcoming discussion in the Capitol. Uh, the panel includes um, Craig Cornett from S Senator Steinberg's office, the budget director, H.D. Uh, Palmer from the Department of Finance, uh, Deborah Gonzalez from uh, the Assembly Republican Leader's Office, uh, and uh, Juliet Williams, who uh, is the reporter for uh, the Associated Press in Sacramento. So it should be a very good look at the upcoming budget discussions, which I'm sure there will be, even though it's been such a smooth ride so far. We're, we'll find something to talk about. Um, and then uh, on February 20th, this is in San Francisco, PPIC is hosting uh, uh, one in a series of speaker series uh, in 2013 and the, the guest on February 20th will be uh, the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, um, Tani Cantil Sakaue. I think I got that right. Um, but the, the event will be at our, off, our uh, uh, conference room in uh, San Francisco in the Finance District. It will also be streamed on our website at ppic.org. And I should also mention that the slides you're about to see from today's report will also be there on the website after, after this presentation. Um, and the registration for the San Francisco event, if you want to do attend, is just going to open today, I believe. So, so with that, let me introduce uh, Paul Warren, who is going to give our presentation about the report today. Paul is a policy associate at PPIC who came to us last year after working many years in this area, especially with the Le Legislative Analyst's Office. So uh, please give a welcome to Paul Warren. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Got all choked up there for a second. Good afternoon, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm just here kind of as a stage setter for the local accountability panel, but it, it works pretty well with the report that came out last week um, called California Changing Accountability System. So just to dive right in, um, for those of you who aren't steeped in what's happening in the education world on accountability, just a little background. There's 
four parts to a, an accountability system. The first part is the content standards, which basically describe what students should be learning in each grade in each subject in, in some detail. The second part are assessments, that is a test that students take that measure how much of that content in the standards uh, students actually learned. And we have star tests which go from grades 2 through 11. And we have other tests including the high school exit exam. Um, then we take these test results and we merge them into an accountability indicator. In California's accountability indicator is the API. Um, there's also a federal accountability indicator which works differently, um, which is called the adequate yearly progress. Uh, the, the, the federal indicator has kind of superseded the state's indicator back in about 2004, but we continue to use the API because it's a well accepted measure of, of uh, school performance. And then there's the kind of the bottom line of uh, consequences and rewards for districts that do well or, or struggle to make progress. And those are currently driven by federal law also. So California's uh, accountability system is changing. Uh, we have new standards, the Common Core standards, and those are uh, in grades 3 through 8 and 11. And then we're developing new tests uh, called the Smarter Balanced Consortium Tests. And those will cover the Common Core standards. And uh, both of those are efforts by states to try to come up with common standards and assessments that uh, are high quality and where we can have comparability across states. Uh, and then recent last session, um, the state actually started to talk about making changes to the API. SB 1458 by Senator Steinberg requires adding other indicators besides test results into the API. So there's a lot going on in this area. And we think there will probably be a lot going on into the future. Uh, no Child Left Behind hasn't been reauthorized um, in a very long time. And as a result, the Obama administration put together a series of waivers that states can apply for um, to have more flexibility and try different approaches to accountability. And I, I, think, I think there's something on the order of 35 states that have received these waivers. We have not. Uh, gotten one. Um, but one of the things that it does is it allows states, actually requires states to come up with their own measure of student progress. That is a, a state designed API. Um, and there are some um, requirements that it has to have both the level and the growth of achievement. And that has to measure graduation rates and uh, measures of college and career readiness. But other than that, states have a lot of flexibility. And if you go and look at what states are doing, there's really very interesting things happening. So we think that the waiver program is probably going to provide a certain amount of template uh, uh, to the negotiations over any reauthorization in, in the future. So we talk about three issues in this paper uh, that are kind of happening now. Uh, that we think people should be aware of and be kind of thinking about and monitoring. The first is there's evidence that teachers are going to need help preparing for the new standards. So the new Common Core standards are a little different from the current standards in that they have a much bigger emphasis on problem solving and, con and concepts. And um, this is on purpose um, because the current tests were considered to be too uh, focused on just bits of knowledge which allows teachers to kind of focus around these things rather than kind of test, you know, teaching the concepts and understanding the knowledge within the context of those concepts. Um, WestEd got a group of teachers together and they um, looked at these standards and in general the teachers were very positive about them. But there was concern uh, in some groups that they really didn't have a lot of experience in teaching concepts and, and these higher level skills and that they would need quite a bit of help to be able to kind of to, to learn how to teach them. So, so the, the bottom line here is that it's always important for, uh, you know, when you're changing things to give teachers the guidance that they need to kind of adapt to a new set of standards. In this case, it might even be a little bit more than typical because there's really perhaps a, a knowledge gap on the part of some groups of teachers. And this is an issue that the state ought to be monitoring. 
The second issue is that the new tests are going to really focus us on growth in individual students. Our current tests are, don't allow us to compare students' growth from, say, grade three to grade four. They're just not designed to do that. The new tests are going to be designed to do that, and so it really opens up a whole new way of thinking about uh, student progress, rather than just looking at, um, you know, how did third graders do this year compared to last year? We're going to be saying, how does Johnny, uh, how did he do compared to last year? Um, and this allows us to have a more accurate API, and, and growth is really considered to be a better measure of school effectiveness uh, compared to levels of, of uh, scores. So what other states are doing in this area of using this growth data is very interesting. Probably the most innovative is in Colorado, where they actually have a growth target for every student. And it's based on kind of what students that are that age and in that subject, and even in the, the range of performance that, that that student had last year, how much growth can you expect on average that student would make? And then you set that target based on, uh, on that data, and, and then schools are evaluated with what percentage of their kids made their individual growth targets. So that kind of creates a very different situation for accountability than this cohort growth that, uh, that we use. So this is a discussion that we got to have about where are we going with accountability, how do we measure growth, um, and, and um, we think it would be really good to start exploring our options on this. Well, what about other state tests? Uh, those of you who are in education know the superintendent Torgson came out with a recommendation to eliminate all non-required state tests. Um, that is, the state tests that the feds don't require. And that means the high school tests would pretty much be eliminated, except for the high school exit exam or something like that. And um, that means the API would be based on dropout rates and, um, and the high school exit exam. And that's, um, that's okay, but it, it only, that's kind of focusing on one part of the high school population. And you might want to have a broader range of indicators. Well, most states don't test as much as we do here in California, and they use other ways, other kinds of data to track the progress of other groups. For instance, um, Florida uses um, IB test and AP test, which kids are already taking all over the country, uh, and, and incorporates that data into their API. Colorado has all students take the PSAT, which has a couple of good benefits, right? It, it makes all kids aware of where they stand in, in, a, in relation to preparation for college, and it's useful information for an accountability system. So when you're talking about, you know, what should we do in the testing system, you always have to think about and how does that affect the API and our accountability system. So uh, if you want more, there's, we have our report. I think you all have copies of it now, uh, so there's no excuses. And uh, we're going to move on to the next part of the presentation, which is our local accountability panel. I'm going to introduce Meryl Vargo, who's the executive director of Pivot Point Learning. I met Meryl way long ago when she worked for the state. She's got lots of experience, both at the state and the local level. And I've really enjoyed this uh, opportunity to work with her. And, and uh, she's going to moderate this panel. So Meryl Vargo. And I think now is a, a perfectly um, good time for our panelists to um, come on up. And let, let me, me just, just say a little bit about, while they're getting seated, I can say a little bit about, uh, the, about them and the goal of this panel. Um, Paul has just given us a picture of what's changing with the state accountability system. I think that we can all guess in general, but probably not predict in particular, the fact that accountability looks different from the local perspective than it does from the state perspective. And the goal of this panel is to explore some of those differences. And we've tried to create a panel that um, gives us the opportunity to see this angle in a short amount of time from a diverse set of perspectives. So I'm not going to read the bios of the individuals here. Uh, they're in your packet, but instead 
just talk a little bit about why they're here and the roles that, um, that, that we expect them to play on this panel. So um, directly to my right, Jonathan Raymond, superintendent from uh, um, the Sacramento City School District, speaking obviously as a superintendent, as a leader at the, at the top of the system. Um, then we've got um, Kim Lawrence, who is currently a fourth grade teacher in Whirlwind Elementary School District, and also a local leader as the president of the local teachers union in that, that school district. Susanna Cooper, um, working for Senator Pro Tem, um, uh, uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate, Daryl Steinberg, um, I just collapsed that, um, uh, and, um, and has the unenviable um, and impossible role on this panel, um, but we're gonna let her off the hook right now of speaking on behalf of the state of California. When I worked for the state and people used to ask me to do that, I would always say, hold everything, the state is a mythical beast, you know, there is no such thing as the state of California. So Susanna is going to speak either on behalf of um, herself or, or the senator, I would suspect. Um, <laughs> or if she wants to speak on behalf of the state, she can. We'll just be a little bit skeptical about where the state lives. Um, uh, and um, last but not least, I've got Crystal Brown here um, representing the parent perspective. Crystal is the founding um, president, is your title president? Founder um, of um, Educate Our State, which is a parent advocacy group. Um, so the, my first question for the panel, and we'll, um, uh, I think we'll go down, skipping Susanna and have her come, go last, but um, st um, uh, starting with Jonathan is fine. Um, <laughs> big picture here, thinking about accountability. What do you like best about the state's accountability system, and <laughs> what's the one thing that, if you could change it, you wouldn't hesitate? So what I like best is that it's changing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm optimistic that, um, that the changes will be, will be positive. I mean, I, you know, as I've said to folks, look, the, you know, 1458 um, has presented us with a, a tremendous opportunity. And, and while the, the new API will still have 60% of that will, will, be, will be test scores, and uh, we know that's going to be changing with the smarter balance, the 40% the, the represents a tremendous opportunity for us. And, and I have urged everyone that will listen to me that, that this is a, a once-in-a-lifetime chance, I mean, at least in, in our near-term lifetime, uh, to do something really bold. Uh, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's not enough emphasis on, you know, what's happening inside of schools. Um, and, you know, as principals have said to me, there's certain nuances. There's things happening in our schools every day that, um, that never gets recognized, that never gets rewarded, and most importantly, um, never gets replicated. And as I like to say, look, there, you know, there's victories happening every day in our classrooms around our school district that just, you know, we just never know about because the, you know, the, the system doesn't measure that. It doesn't place any value on, on, on that. So the, the fact that we now have an opportunity to look at this, to, to really do something about it, to, you know, to create what I, what I would say would be systems that are about you know, continually getting better, right? Um, if, if we're not trying to get better every day, and, and, and if we're not thinking about how do we do it together in a, in a collaborative way, I, th I think we've missed a great opportunity. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, qualitative review systems, and you know some some call it inspection, uh, you know, as a way to add that that other very rich dynamic, which is getting into schools, getting into classrooms, and really seeing the you know that rich dynamic that's going on. So I'm, um, uh, I would say to your question, the fact that our system doesn't allow for any of that right now, it's all, it's all uh, quantitative, um, and the fact that it's changing is, is a really good thing. I hope. And, and that will take advantage of, of this. I would say, though, that early indications from all those that are talking about making changes, you know, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as I was a couple months ago. I mean, just because they seem to be going down that same route of trying to trying to look at things. I, you know, I know that measurement is real important and um, validity and reliability. Um, but I think we may have to sacrifice a little bit of that in this 40 percent to get at some of the things that are important, like 
how do you measure project-based learning and, and looking at using rubrics to really assess uh, in a portfolio approach, you know, you know how a, how a, how a student has progressed, you know, working along a project where they're demonstrating mastery over a couple years. I mean, think about those of you who have gone to to, to graduate school and completed a master's. You 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 had to make a presentation, you had to make a, a defense, and you know you were you were judged and uh, as to how well you had mastered material. Um, it's hard to, to measure that in a single test, but they can be measured with some degree of reliability and validity. You know, we just have to, to figure out, you know, what's our tolerance for that. How about you, Kim? How does this look from a teacher's perspective? Um, there's some mixed feelings about it. Again, the fact that the accountability, accountability system is changing, teachers are positive about that. However, there is that concern of what exactly is it going to look like? Um, concerns over, we hear now it's going to be computer-based, how is that going to look, how are we going to accomplish it at our school sites. Um, but the biggest uh, positive I see on, from teachers is that they're now looking at it of, now I get to teach. Because um, as was said earlier, we have these benchmarks we need to meet by the end of the year with the current state testing. with you know, the fill in the bubbles and which is the right answer. Teachers have been forced to, as it states in the report, teach to the test because that's what we're judged on. Every year when we go back to school, it's like, okay, great. You now have an API of 925. Now what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And teachers are always feeling that they're behind, I kind of like think like Indiana Jones with the big ball rolling behind them. They're, they're constantly at this frenetic pace to try and reach um, these goals. Teachers know at heart that we need to teach in depth, that we can't do the shallow, cursory, let's give you this knowledge in the kind of society and in the kind of developments that are happening and the workforce that we need to prepare them for. Um, we need to take that time to really give them that in-depth education and that knowledge and being able to think and asking questions. Um, as part of Moreland's work last year and continuing this year with Pivot is we're re redoing our teacher evaluation system where it's more rubric based. Um, and I sat on that committee and it was really exciting to talk about, okay, what are we going to evaluate teachers on? And the scariest thing from my members was there's a piece in there that talks about student growth well, there, and student learning. And there's a big difference between student learning and student achievement. Achievement is a snapshot, one point in time, this is your score on this day at this time. Student growth is looking at, like you said, over a few years, have you met those targets? Have you, have you shown growth? Are you learning? Are you progressing? Um, and so I think that really is the most exciting thing for teachers, is looking at students and, okay, here's where I get you at the beginning of this year. How far can I get you? And what supports are going to be there to help me get you there? Okay, now I said this panel was going to be um, uh, some surprising messages. So um, we heard Jonathan say, I think, not so surprising, um, but important for everybody to hear, hey, leave us room to, um, to be accountable for some stuff that's hard to measure, but that really matters. I heard Kim say, not so surprising, but important to hear, what teachers want for accountability, from accountability is room to still teach. Um, but she also said, and I hope everybody heard it, here's a group of teachers who got very excited about redesigning their teacher evaluation system and building in some growth measures and measures of student learning. That's not the version of teachers um, and teacher evaluation that, that you hear in the news. Um, okay, Crystal, from parents, surprise us some more. <laughs> what do parents want from, what, what do you like, what do parents like and what would, is, what's their number one wish about accountability? Uh, well, I just thank you for including the parent voice in this discussion because it is important um, that we share. We're not policymakers, um, and probably most of you know a lot more than we do, except for that we know what's going on with our child and what's going on in the classroom down to the local level. So thank you for including this voice. 
Um, I would say, you know, we're happy that there is the notion of accountability because we want to trust the system, we want it to trust uh, the staff, the teachers, the administration. Um, I think that what we really want at the end of the day is, an, is to make sure that, that this type of accountability is being used for some purpose and the real purpose is to make sure our children get an amazing education and they have a teacher who's inspired and supported and all of those things. And right now, it's just clear that the system isn't providing that. That, 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 that why would we want our children to be tested if at the end of the day they're not testing um, measures that really talk about how to support our children better and that the data is not being used in a way that's, that's productive and that's supportive for teachers and for administrators. So I would say, you know, what, what I like is that, that, there, that it exists. Um, and I'm speaking on, you know, personally, but also on behalf of the thousands of parents I've talked to over the past few years in town hall meetings and house parties. And what we find is that um, locally, at the school site, parents and usually other staff know which teachers are doing a really good job and which aren't. And I don't know what measure there is, but I could say many people I talk to know that there is that, that idea that um, how do you measure something that people already know? And how do we then support those teachers that maybe need to be encouraged um, or supported or don't have the tools that they need? How to, so, so what I would like to see is a connection between those two things. And I think that the movement towards multiple measures um, and not having it be a punitive system would then lead to um, really better outcomes for kids. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, down at the local level, I think there is more um, accountability and um, in different ways. So accountability um, for, for our kids, accountability for the parents, for the teachers, um, even from sort of the finance system. And it would be great to have that connection from Sacramento down to the local level um, and, and, and um, trust. So for example, I meet with my teacher, my children's teacher four times a year. They seem to be doing all types of tests, spelling tests, reading one-on-one. -on -one. They have had projects. They seem to know how my child's doing. And I don't, and, and then in April, there's a test on one day, um, testing very few things. And so the relationship between those two seems to be broken. And, um, and I will say, when we were going around the state and, and um, talking to tons of parents, one of the worst things I heard, I drove home from a house party in, in Silicon Valley, and someone said, look, we only test science in fourth and eighth grade in, in our district. So really, a lot of our teachers don't have time right now to teach the, the full standard for science, in, except for in fourth and eighth grade. And I just drove home, passing Google and Yahoo and, and Genentech, thinking, there's something broken if, if, if teachers don't feel like they have the time or the support system to be teaching something every year, all, all year long, or the flexibility. So I'll stop. <laughs> let, let Susanna jump in. So Susanna, anything broken there that you guys are uh, um, on task to fix? <laughs> uh, yeah, we could go down a list. Um, I wanted to just echo Jonathan's uh, sense of opportunity that we have with the implementation of SB 1458. Um, I think it's a chance for us to think more broadly and a little differently about what we want our schools to do. Because as a state, through the API, um, we have been sending them signals that are far too narrow uh, about what's important. We've mainly been saying, get the bubble test scores up in English language arts and math. And you know a few, a few other things at some grade levels on the side here. But that was really the main driver. Um, and you know, one of the things we learned in the process of moving the bill and its predecessor bill was how much agreement and frustration there was about the, the narrowness of that message, which, um, you know, even though we've got uh, NCLB and AYP layered on the top and there's lots of different signals coming at uh, our schools, the API remained a very powerful driver and uh, it can continue to be that. Um, and, and I think we can do better. And now we've got the room to figure out how to do that. Now it's you know a little bit of a black box because the state board is tasked with making some decisions about what happens with that other 40%. And there are some complicated issues that they need to sift through, some of them having to do with validity and reliability and you know, and how how far do they want to go on that on that end and how much does that exclude some of the other 
uh, measures that we all might agree are important uh, for schools to live up to. Um, the other thing I, I just I wanted to remind folks of is that the 1458 only addresses accountability for high schools. Now, that doesn't mean that the state board uh, doesn't have a chance here to look at accountability for middle and elementary as well. Look at the whole system, and I, I strongly hope that they will. Um, and then lastly, I, I didn't want us to, any of us, to get stuck in thinking that the accountability system is the only way that we can achieve change in our schools. I think we need to have a serious discussion about how we fund our schools. Um, and I'm not talking about the weighted pupil formula. We can talk about that later. Um, we, you know, we're tremendously relieved that Prop 30 passed and we, you know, feel like we're out from under, uh, you know, some, a terrible set of decisions that we would have had to make had, had it not passed. But we're still, in my view, only up to a subsistence level. We're not funding our schools at a level that would allow them to do a lot of the things that folks have talked about here. Um, so I don't, I don't want us to get caught in the idea that if we just get the accountability piece right, we will have solved the problem. Okay, we'll be sure not to think that if we just do accountability, it'll all, well, we can all go home um, and be done. Um, so we got a big picture here of, of, of an opportunity, a chance to make accountability broader. Um, I think uh, uh, that was clear. I think we'd all agree, though, that the, at the center of that, we still have the idea of testing. Um, even if we had less testing, if we had better testing, I haven't heard anybody uh, argue, at least on this panel, for no testing. Um, so I wonder if we could just spend a couple of minutes um, talking, uh, going a little bit deeper about testing. And um, I'm going to just ask everybody, from their perspective, what's the test data that is most useful for somebody in your role, and how do you use it? So any, any uh, that I didn't warn the panel about that um, that particular question. So anybody anybody ready to say um, uh, what, how do you use how, how do you use it? Crystal, you really made an argument for let's do something about this data. And often people in Sacramento say, well, we got to test all the kids in all the subjects every year because parents need to know. Um, do parents need to know? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I would say there's a little bit of split in the parent community um, and probably many of your parents, so you can just think about what you feel. Uh, some of us think that uh, we just test entirely too much and that, again, it, we, we begin to t teach to the test or the, the, the teacher feels um, the pressure and that's really not what our kids need um, exclusively. But I think um, I, heard, I heard someone from Finland speaking about um, why, when you test your blood, you test every blood cell, and you know we're testing our every kid every year. And and what? Why? What is the purpose of these tests? And and is that alone a, a, a gauge of how well our kids are doing? Again, we've we've now sat across from the teacher. We have you know they come home with different tests, spelling tests or whatever it is. So what is that snapshot telling us about? our child or about maybe even their teacher. I would say um, on, over the years, if you see a huge drop, then maybe the, the parent would, would be worried. But you're going to wait till April um, after five years to, to, to know that maybe there's a problem? It doesn't seem to make sense. We're talking, you know, and then, and then I'm not advocating for testing every day. I just think we have, there needs to be some trust in the system um, in relationship, the relationship between the teachers and the students. And I do just want to follow up with, um, you know, I hope we have some time to talk about accountability with regard to the finance system locally, because I think that's a really important point that Susanna brought up. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Jonathan? What's, what, what, as a superintendent, what data do you use, and what do you use it for? What test scores matter to you? <clears throat> the, the data we get now is, you know, is virtually worthless. Uh, you know, these assessments are given in, in April. We get them in back in, in August. Kids have moved on. I mean, there's... You know, it's the word autopsy data. I mean, that's all it's really valued for. So there's, it's an assessment of learning, but it's not an assessment for learning. And, and that, I think, is the big difference. Um, you want to assess so, so you can change instruction. You know, it's not a question of, if the, if the child hasn't learned material, 
it's because we haven't taught the material the way the child needs to learn it. So, you know, that requires <coughs> fine tuning and, uh, and adjustment. And so the, the data has to be rich, it has to be readily available, it, it has to be focused on, you know, what we're, what we're intending the child to learn. So having data that we can look at so we can, we can ad adjust and fine tune instruction. I mean, <coughs> and when you see teachers doing this collaboratively, looking over student work, right, which is a much better gauge than, than most assessments that are developed by testing companies, um, in my view, f if you're truly intending to assess for learning. Um, when you look at student work, you can adjust on the fly. And when you see teachers looking at, you know, this is what we expected, here's the rubrics that we developed, um, this is what the child's and, our, and, and, and the kids were doing just yesterday, boy, we can adjust and we can start teaching differently today. Um, you know, it's, it can happen that quickly. It's, it's, it's you know, I mean, the America uh, Cup uh, is, is, is sailing in the bay. I mean, look how quickly they adjust and, 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 and make changes. And we have to be able to do, be much more nimble in, in public education. From my standpoint, I like to look at it from a variance standpoint, all right? So, you know, when you have good data that is giving you a good current snapshot, you can look cl classroom to classroom, school to school, you know, where is the variances and how do we minimize the variances and how do we provide more resources, more supports for schools or teachers that seem to be struggling based upon whether or not their students are, are learning. That's how, that's how data is best used and how we like to use data. Okay, so from the perspective of a superintendent, the data that matters is, um, is local data to improve teaching and learning, but the state data helps him identify places to intervene. Be, intervene. Is, is that, uh, is, I think did the, I get that? I think you, you, you got the first part. Um, um, <laughs> you know, the state data that, that we get back from, from CSTs, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't really have a lot of value for us. I mean, you know, we're augmenting it with, with, with everything we can, and these days it's mostly student work. Kim, what do you look at as a teacher? Um, again, day to day, the work that my students are doing. So the, the, what drives my instruction is looking at the work that they're doing. If it's a piece of writing, I can look at the writing and go, okay, this student needs to work on paragraph structure, this student needs to work on organization or the mechanics or those kinds of things. <coughs> again, looking at the data that we get from the CSTs at the beginning of each school year, we dive deep into it. We look at each little individual section, and it's like, oh, the student scored really low on this one section on the test. Well, there's only two questions on that. So do I want to spend an entire unit on two questions? Again, it's that very snapshot, let's pick and choose um, of what's being assessed. I also look at it, this is my first year in fourth grade. So I used to teach, I taught for first grade forever. First grade isn't given a standardized test, neither is kindergarten. So on those days when we would come back for staff development at the beginning of the year, it's like, oh, well, first grade kindergarten, we don't have stuff for you, so you just, you know. So a lot of the assessments that we would do in first grade were one-on-one -on -one assessments, very time consuming. It would be 45 minutes, three or four times a year, I would spend individually one-on-one -on -one with students. That was the data that I would use to drive my reading instruction or my math instruction. Um, our kindergarten and first grade teachers are amazing. I mean, that's a lot of time, and that's how they coordinate their instruction. For the rest of us, I'm putting myself back in that other than the fourth grade group now, looking just currently what our district is doing, and I think a lot of states in the a lot of districts of the state are doing. We benchmark three times a year um, in language arts and math. So they're based on the end of the year standards. So in October, we give a benchmark based on the end of the year standards. And then we have to look at that data and go, OK, well, what didn't they do well in? Well, they didn't do well in these things because I haven't gotten there yet. So what kind of information is that data giving me? It's not really giving me that much information to drive my instruction. Plus, the kids are looking at this going, we're doing this again? you know? So. I, that. Yeah, I know. It's right. I mean, I hear that from my own son. You know, my own son who's like, okay, I got this, Mom. I don't want to do this over and over again. And then looking at it, he's now in middle school. So looking at it from a middle school standpoint, by the time the CST rolls around, he doesn't want to fill in another bubble. I mean, he's done. And so there's also that attitude that comes in. Um, 
one of the things that I hear most from teachers, and myself as well, is there's that time component. So if we really want to look at student work and use that to drive our instruction, use that to inform the choices that we make, we have to have the time to be able to do that. And we can't do that at 3.30 in the afternoon. You know, there needs to be either days built into the school year or early release days built in, more staff development days, something that will help us take that information and really impact the instruction that's happening in the classroom. And I'm a real firm believer in the changes that are going to happen are going to come from that level as opposed to coming down from, okay, here's your new assessment, change what you're doing so that your kids will score well on this assessment. Um, so um, actionable data at the local level is harder than it might look. <laughs> what about at the state level? What does the state do? What does the state need? What, how does data used now or should be used at the state level? Well, I, I was thinking about <coughs> it in terms of assessment, and I was actually thinking actually, what is most valuable to me as a parent is the kind of assessment that Kimberly is talking about. And you know, I think it, is, it has huge value for us at the state level, even though it's not data that we receive or crunch or figure out what to do with. It's between the, the teacher and their students. Um, I mean, there, there are a number of different other data points that would be very useful, uh, particularly in the area of measuring students' readiness for college and career. Um, and that would help in this discussion about how do we rebuild the API with some more indicators that are meaningful. Um, but, but back on assessment and what assessment is useful to us at the state level, I think it's especially as kids get up into the middle and high school grades, I think there is a, a question, and we don't really know the answer, but how, um, how much are the CSTs and ultimately the Smarter Balanced Assessments actually telling us about what students know? at that level. Uh, these tests don't necessarily have much relevance to them. They don't have much consequences for them. The Casey certainly does. But you know, CSTs don't. So is the fact that we're disappointed in the CST results at the high school level a function of the fact that the kids don't care about how well they do? They're not invested in the outcome of those tests, telling them that, hey, it matters for the API is not probably going to be real compelling. <laughs> For them, and as Kimberly suggested, it's like, oh, God, you know, another bubble test. So, um, I think if if we're going to use tests for accountability, we need to think really hard about whether those tests are truly giving us a picture of what students uh, know and can do at the schools that are then being judged by the results of those tests. So we've been really focused here about um, students, the impact of um, accountability on students, about testing, how much testing, what does it feel to feel like to um, a middle school student to be asked to do one more bubble test. Um, I want to go back before I open it up to questions um, to the issue that uh, Kim raised in her opening uh, comments about teacher evaluation and the use of data to evaluate teachers. Um, uh, Kim, as you think about that work that you guys did in Moreland, um, what lessons did you learn about local work to redesign teacher evaluation and include data in that that state folks, that policymakers um, and people whose job it is to represent the state perspective, what do they what do they need to hear? What do they need to know about what you learned? It's um, through that process. It's messy. No. Um, messy? It is, it is kind of, it, well, it is kind of messy. I mean, there's messy a lot of. Messy has been a theme here. Yeah, messy has <laughs> been a theme. Um, there, there needs to be a, a shift in what the evaluation process is used for. I think that was one of our biggest ahas, or at least mine. Um, for, and let me also say one more thing. It, you could have the best evaluation process in the world. It could be spelled out, everybody could buy into it, but if your administrators aren't trained in how to use it, it all that work is gone for nothing. So administrators also need to know how the process works, what um, their responsibilities are, what um, procedures they need to follow. Um, because no one, uh, teachers included, if, if there is that teacher who is nearing retirement, who we need to maybe find a different position for, or 
encourage them to retire, then that's what we need to do. But that also falls on the principle of knowing what those procedures and processes are. Um, the biggest focus of when we were looking at our evaluation system, when we were talking about student growth, um, there was a comment, there was a quote in one of the articles that we read, and I mentioned it earlier, student learning versus student achievement. We really need to look at student learning um, as opposed to that, again, snapshot achievement of what they've done. The, the most um, exciting thing that happened during our work was the conversations that happened between the principals, the administration, the superintendent. We were all in the room together, um, teachers from each of the school sites. And how common our interests were as far as what we wanted to accomplish out of this project. Um, the model needs to be more of a coaching model as opposed to a gotcha model. Evaluations often looked at as, okay, the principal comes through your room twice a year for 20 minutes, takes notes, sits down with you, says, okay, this is what I saw, this is what you did well, this is what I want you to work on, done for two years. This model is more of a coaching model. So you'll sit down and you'll have that conversation with that teacher and you'll say, okay, here's the California standards for the teaching profession. Where do you think you are? What, what would you like to work on this year? You know, do you have a goal for this year? Yeah, my goal would be to, for me for fourth grade, my goal would be I want to learn to do literature circles this year because I've never done it before. Okay, that's your goal. That's what I'm going to come in and observe you on. That's where I'm going to provide the support. Meet with me several times during the year. Come in and watch in my classroom. And then we have a conversation at the end of the year. How do you think you did? What support can I give you for next year? So it's more of a support model. And along those same lines, our principals are being pulled in so many directions, they don't have the time to be in our classrooms. And again, how do you know what's happening in your classrooms if you're not in there on a regular basis? So again, it's just that whole shift of we're in it together, we're coaching, we're working together, as opposed to I'm going to come in and I'm going to find something, you know, and I'm going to get you on it, which is what a lot of teachers feel that the current system is. Jonathan, how about from your perspective? Teacher evaluation? I said earlier, it, you know, it, it's got to be about, you know, how do we get better? It's got to be about built around continuous Im, Im, improvement. I mean, let's be realistic. You know, if, if um, you know, it, it, it is not easy to dismiss a teacher. It just isn't in California um, and, and, and other states. And, and all that effort and energy that goes into that. Um, and, 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 and again, I, I think most teachers in the middle, again, you know, you probably have um, 15 or 20 percent just you know excellent teachers and you, and you and you have some amount on the bottom that I think as Kimberly said we need to encourage into other professions or to retire but but that leaves a big uh, a big group in the middle and um, you know we've just got to work together at how do we get better at this profession and which is why I think the common core is so exciting because the common core is a huge shift right I mean even there's some quotes that uh, David put in in his report um, you know, teachers, what's, what's required of the Common Core, for, you know, from a content and a pedagogy is, 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 a, is a huge shift. Um, you know, teachers need to relearn content and they need to relearn practice if, if we're really going to take advantage of this opportunity. And, and that's exciting because that means we can get better at, at our craft. And so, again, what you measure gets done. If, if systems are punitive, um, then that's what you're going to get. Um, but if if systems truly are about you know continuous Im Im improvement, coaching, we're in this together. There's a sense of collective efficacy around the work. You know, then people will improve, and more importantly, they'll improve together. And 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 that's when it gets very exciting. So back to the theme that shifting to the Common Core and a growth model is an opportunity um, to rethink many aspects of accountability, including teacher evaluation. Um, uh, Crystal and Susanna, um, anything to add on this, on this theme? Well, I'll just, unless you had some, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> I'll just say that, you know, I think, I, I, I love hearing what um, everyone's saying, and I think it's, it's it, you know, we should design a system that supports this sort of combined, less punitive nature. And at the same time, part of me thinks, you know, I don't want my child to waste one day in a classroom 
with a teacher who isn't well supported. I know they, that no teacher goes into teaching um, to, to feel like they're, they've got someone, you know, looking over their shoulder ready to pounce. They want to be supported and developed and all of those things. But as a parent, if that's not happening and our system's not supporting that, then why would I want to send my child into a classroom that at, at nine months later, someone's going to say, you know, actually, you're not doing this that well, and we've now figured this out over the summer. And the whole year, my bright-eyed kindergarten is, kindergartner is like, hey, I'm here to learn, and I want to be with a teacher that's ready to teach. And so, I, so in my head, I'm thinking, how do we support that teacher? How do we make sure that that principal and that administrator and that district have the tools and the policies that they need to make sure that's happening every day? They, they don't have another 10 years to figure this out. They're done with school by then. So let's figure it out now, and let's make sure that we're, we're coming together now and not in five years when we've lost more generations. So I, I obviously feel passionately about it that I don't think this is about just the system. This is about you know, what are we getting at at the end of the day, and, and, and we need to sort of scrap this notion that there's going to be a perfect system and come together and say, what are we after? We're after making sure these kids have what they need and the teachers are well prepared and well supported and that they have the time to do all that they need to do that, that absolutely is in the best interest of that kid. <coughs> so um, there you have it. There you go. <laughs> Susanna, are you going to fix this? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure what role there is for the state in, in fixing whatever ails teacher evaluation. I think, I think that teacher evaluation systems need to be bargained locally. I think there needs to be an agreement about um, what teachers are being held accountable for through their evaluation system. Um, and I, you know, the state law does provide some, uh, some kind of guideposts which I think are adequate. And as you know, we just had a big lawsuit in Los Angeles that was resolved with an agreement between LA Unified and the United Teachers of Los Angeles that um, requires consideration of student uh, students' performance on particular kinds of measures. And um, you know, I think it was appropriate that they came to that agreement locally. I, you know, at the state level, I think we do need to pay. Uh, a lot of attention to how we are, uh, how we're supporting professional development, particularly in this period of time when we're transitioning from the existing standards to the Common Core standards, and you've got a lot of teachers saying, um, you know, hey, wait a minute, how am I, how am I going to be effective in, in this this new world? Uh, so I, I do think there's a strong role for the state there, and also in um, teacher preparation programs. We the state through the Teacher Credentialing Commission accredits teacher preparation programs. Um, I think we should be, you know, we've, we've placed a, a one-year limit on the amount of time that's, that candidates can spend in credentialing for, you know, what is a really complex undertaking and career. Uh, and I think we need to think about whether that's enough. I want to thank the panel for um, making this issue of accountability, which I'm sure none of us thought was simple, um, more complicated. <laughs> Uh, um, and um, but also I think calling attention to the fact that accountability is a live issue at the local level it's not something that state the state does to local leaders and that local leaders don't care about or pay attention to um, I think um, uh, I got a sense listening to all of these folks talk that that these are these are people who feel in their own way and in their own role highly accountable um, <laughs> And, and I think from that perspective, we've, uh, our, our, our system with all of its flaws is perhaps, perhaps um, on its way to being at least a partial success. Um, and I think, and I want to thank everybody for being here and for caring about this issue. I'm sure that this is a conversa conversation that will be continued over the months and probably years to come. So, so thank you. Panelists, I'm sure we'll be happy to stay around. I saw a couple of hands at the end. Um, and answer additional questions. So thank you all for being here.